from uh, Caltech. So he's going to be talking about single shot error correction. Yeah, thanks, Earl. Uh, so yeah, it's great to be here in uh, Sydney. And I want to thank the organizers for putting on such a great conference. Uh, so yeah, today I'm happy to talk to you guys about single shot uh, decoding for these good quantum LDPC codes. And this was joint work with uh, Eugene, Libor, Shinho, uh, Sunny, and Alex. And, and many of them are in the audience right now. And um, yeah, if you want more information, you can also find our uh, paper on the archive. Uh, so to start off, like we know that quantum computers can solve uh, certain problems faster than classical ones. Uh, but if we want to run uh, large instances of those problems, we're going to have to use quantum error correction. And um, when we have uh, error correcting code, uh, then that's going to have some extra overheads involved. Uh, and in, in particular, there's going to be uh, space overhead and time overhead. So for the space overhead, uh, that's going to be uh, dictated uh, by the choice of code that we use. So like, like if our code has a high encoding rate, then, then that's going to be good. And if it has high distance, then, then maybe we don't need to go to very large uh, block lengths to achieve the same error suppression. And also, uh, we should also consider like the uh, number of ancilla qubits that are needed for a certain uh, error correcting code. Uh, but another type of overhead is the time overhead needed for error correction. And that's uh, going to be the difference between implementing uh, gates uh, like at the physical level versus uh, uh, implementing logical gates uh, on the encoded information. And the time overhead that's needed uh, is actually also going to be uh, determined by what kind of decoding algorithm we use. So uh, in particular, um, uh, depending on what decoding algorithm uh, you use, uh, you might need to run more uh, error correction rounds before uh, you, uh, performing each uh, logical gate. And so today, I want to talk to you about um, single shot error correction, where uh, you may only need to uh, run the decoding algorithm like once uh, between each logical operation. So the outline for my talk is uh, here. So uh, first, I'm going to uh, say a bit about LDPC codes and, and why we think that uh, these can be used for a low overhead uh, fault tolerant uh, computation. Uh, then I'll get into the decoding problem. And in this part, I'll also define exactly what it means to uh, have a single shot decoder. Um, and then in the third part, I'll give our main results on single shot decoding for uh, quantum Tanner codes, which is a family of uh, asymptotically good uh, LDPC codes. And then I'll give some uh, concluding remarks. OK, so uh, this is a QEC crowd. So like you guys uh, know all of this stuff already. But let me just uh, fix some notation. Uh, so a stabilizer code is going to be the uh, some subspace of the n qubit um, Hilbert space. And it's going to be the plus one eigenspace of uh, an abelian subgroup of the polygroup. And we say that a code is CSS if this uh, stabilizer group can be generated by two sets. Uh, one is uh, SX, which is, uh, consists of products of uh, X-type uh, poly operators. And another one is going to be uh, SZ. Uh, so for CSS codes, uh, instead of working with the full 4 to the n dimensional uh, space of poly operators, we can instead uh, translate them uh, into vectors in F2 to the n. Uh, and the way that we do it is uh, we identify poly X or poly Z type operators uh, with their support. And that's going to be some subset of the qubits. And, and we just treat that as a vector in F2 to the n. Uh, so for example, uh, if we want to analyze the stabilizer group, we can in instead uh, associate some uh, parity check matrices, uh, which are like binary matrices, uh, H, X, and H, Z. Uh, for example, like if S is um, uh, generated by X1, X2, uh, X2, X3, like in the repetition code, uh, then um, uh, H, X is going to have this form where the first row corresponds to the first uh, stabilizer generator uh, because it has non-zero support on the first and second qubits. Uh, and similarly, the second row will, will correspond to the uh, uh, second stabilizer generator. And if we have these parity check matrices, that will tell us all the information we need to know about uh, the uh, CSS code. And, and so like the syndrome uh, is going to be given by this uh, matrix vector multiplication uh, where the uh, the EZ is telling us the location of uh, where the Z errors uh, have occurred. And so if we do this uh, multiplication, then, then that will give us the uh, um, binary uh, uh, bit string sigma, which is the syndrome. OK, so for CSS codes, we can talk about uh, certain properties that it has. Uh, so we have these parameters. The, uh, the first one is the code length 
uh, n, the number of physical qubits. And then we have the dimension k, the number of uh, encoded logical qubits. And we have the distance d, which is the weight of the smallest uh, non-trivial logical operator. And we say that, uh, uh, so there's also this additional property of a low density parity check, or LDPC. And, and uh, if a code has this property, it means that um, the parity check matrices Hx and Hz are sparse, so a constant number of ones in each uh, row and column. And uh, that's like particularly useful because um, like the lower weight checks are gonna be easier to uh, measure in practice. Uh, and it's also important for uh, fault tolerance uh, purposes because um, when you do the uh, checks, then it's possible for some errors to uh, spread to other errors like, uh, uh, sorry, for, for errors to spread to other qubits uh, within that uh, check. So, so it's desirable to have this uh, LDPC property. Uh, but then a natural question to ask is, like, uh, what are the best possible parameters? So what are the best scalings of uh, K and D with N uh, for these uh, LDPC codes? And, and this was a question, you know, that, that kind of has uh, uh, some history, that, and it was only answered uh, recently. Uh, but uh, so, so like we started off with the Torah code, uh, which is an LDPC code, and uh, it has this additional property that uh, the checks are geometrically local. Uh, so that's really nice. Uh, but the uh, parameter scaling is not super great uh, because it only encodes a constant number of qubits and the distance scaling is uh, square root. Uh, but if we do require these uh, geometrically local checks for these like topological codes, then, then actually like um, there's the uh, bravi pool and Hall bound which says, says that uh, this is the best that you can do. So we actually need to relax this uh, geometric locality condition to uh, achieve better parameters. Uh, so. Uh, then there were like um, kind of uh, constructions with better and better parameters, like uh, uh, kind of like starting off with this like hypergraph uh, product codes, uh, which has the same distance scaling but is encoding a lot more uh, qubits. Uh, and then uh, based on this, you know, kind of, uh, hypergraph product or homological product, uh, there are some uh, variations of it that can achieve uh, better parameters. Uh, in particular, we have these fiber bundle codes, lifted product codes, uh, balanced product codes. Uh, until it was eventually uh, proven in, in 2021 uh, that we can actually achieve uh, the so-called like asymptotically good parameters uh, where the um, dimension and distance are both uh, scaling linearly with the uh, block length. And, and for these, uh, these codes, uh, as uh, Nico also was uh, talking about earlier today, it's based on this uh, balanced product or uh, lifted product uh, construction. And, and after uh, this was proven, there were also some uh, variations of this uh, construction uh, in the form of uh, quantum Tanner codes and these uh, DHLV codes uh, that also achieve uh, the same uh, parameter scaling. Uh, so for this talk, uh, I'm mainly focusing on the quantum Tanner codes. Okay, but like when we have uh, codes with really good parameters, so, so that's really great, uh, but uh, in practice, like we need to actually be, like, be able to correct errors um, when they occur and, and uh, get back into the code state. So this is the decoding problem. And the setup is that like uh, some unknown uh, error is going to be applied to the code state. Let's say some, some poly error E is applied. Then we extract the syndrome by measuring the stabilizers so that that's just a, a bit string sigma. Um, so it's a classical bit string. And we input this bit string to our decoder uh, and, and the decoder will uh, output a correction uh, E tilde. And the, uh, it will have succeeded in decoding if uh, E tilde times E is a stabilizer, uh, because uh, we know that uh, stabilizers uh, act trivially on the code state. Okay, so in, in general, like uh, finding decoder for some arbitrary uh, stabilizer code is uh, very difficult. Uh, in fact, it's like an MP complete uh, problem. So, so we can't do it in general. Uh, but like we do know uh, many efficient decoders, and. Like if we have a code that we want to actually use, then, then of course we're going to need to have a, an efficient decoders. Um, so for the uh, good uh, LDPC codes that I was talking about, so, so the three different uh, constructions, uh, in, in fact, uh, linear time decoders have been found for uh, all of them. So that's really nice. Um, but now like, I want to take it one step further. Uh, so these uh, decoders assume that the input is actually the syndrome uh, sigma. So, so it assumes the perfect uh, syndrome as the input. Uh, but in practice, like when we go about um, 
extracting the syndrome, like, you know, we apply some quantum circuit and, and get the measurement outcomes, like all of those components are faulty. So it's uh, very likely that the syndrome is not going to be ideal. And there can be some, some errors in, in the syndrome. So then what do we do? Uh, well, there are some uh, standard procedures. So the simplest one is, is this uh, Shore uh, scheme, where we just repeat measurement rounds. So we just keep repeating the measurements until we get some uh, consistent results. And then we can uh, assume that there was no measurement uh, uh, errors in, uh, uh, for, like in the syndrome that, uh, that was extracted. Uh, so the problem with this approach is that, uh, of course, there's going to be some like, large time overhead involved because you're repeating the measurement round so many times. And, and in fact, you have to repeat a number of rounds like proportional to the distance uh, or even the distance squared. Uh, there's another approach uh, proposed by Steen uh, where we can prepare some more complicated ancilla state uh, offline and use that ancilla state to do like a more robust version of the measurement. Um, so then, then that will kind of give us the correct uh, measurement result. But then because you have this more complicated ancilla state, then that's going to uh, incur a large uh, space overhead. So we, we see that like both of these uh, generic approaches uh, will incur some large overhead. And uh, in particular, that could weaken some uh, quantum advantage uh, you know, over some classical algorithm. Uh, and uh, more importantly, like, uh, as we heard in the, in the last few talks, like, we could run into some backlog problems if we're not able to uh, decode uh, faster than the errors accumulate, and, and then you won't be, like, be able to apply the next uh, logical operation uh, very, very uh, quickly. So an alternative to these generic uh, approaches was uh, proposed by Bombin uh, in the form of single-shot quantum error correction. And the idea here is that like, sometimes the decoding problem has a lot of structure, and, and so much so that like, even when the decoder takes in uh, a faulty syndrome data as input, it can still make progress in decoding. So what that means is that like, uh, you might, uh, it might not output uh, a perfect correction that like, takes you exactly back into the code space, but it will leave some like, very small residual error so that you can still continue with um, the computation. Um, so, so this is a very um, uh, promising approach like if we're able to have codes uh, that support single-shot quantum error correction. And when we talk about uh, single-shot uh, error correction or even just decoding in general, uh, there's kind of two settings that we can consider. The first is uh, the setting of adversarial noise. So in this setting, we want to be able to decode any error of sufficiently small weight. And, and that usually means uh, any error of uh, weight up to a con some constant fraction of the distance. Then there's the stochastic setting, which uh, may be more realistic, where there's some uh, random model for how errors occur. Let's say some like IID errors. And the decoder has to be able to decode uh, these random errors with high probability. Now these two settings are usually not comparable uh, uh, with each other because in the stochastic case, like we don't have to decode all errors just uh, with high probability. And in the adversarial case, we, not, um, we might not have to decode errors of very high weight, uh, or particular, in particular if the uh, distance is uh, small. But for these good quantum LDPC codes, uh, the distance is going to be scaling linearly with the uh, block length. So in fact, if we can decode in the adversarial setting, that will automatically imply the stochastic case uh, for sufficiently small um, probabilities of error. OK, so uh, single shot decoders uh, uh, have been found uh, for certain families of codes. So I'll just go over some, some uh, families right now. Uh, the first one is like these topological codes. So we know that for uh, 4D Tora code, uh, 3D subsystem Tora code, and 3D gauge color code, uh, it is possible to do uh, single shot quantum error correction. And the idea for these uh, decoders is that you make use of some redundancies in the check operators. So uh, here, I, uh, I took a figure from uh, this uh, 3D subsystem Tora code uh, paper. And um, these strings are going to be the syndromes. And it has some additional structure that uh, these strings should uh, form closed uh, loops. So if you see that the strings do not form closed loops, 
then you know that some syndrome error has occurred, and you can try to like fix up the uh, syndrome error first before proceeding with the decoding. Uh, and for these topological codes, it was mostly uh, considered in the case of uh, stochastic noise, so, so, so it was proven in that setting that you can do single shot uh, error correction. So another type of uh, codes with the single shot property is these uh, expansion-based LDPC codes. Uh, and I'm thinking of these like quantum expander codes in particular, uh, which was proven by uh, Fauzi, Graspellier, and Leverrier. So here, the expand, uh, here the single shot property is not based on any redundancies of the checks, but it's more uh, based on the expansion of the underlying complex. So somehow, like the expansion of the complex uh, provides the necessary um, conditions for a single shot air, uh, quantum error correction. And for uh, these quantum expander codes, um, it has the single shot property for both the adversarial case uh, and the stochastic uh, setting. Uh, but like some significant work had to be done to go from the adversarial case to the stochastic setting. Now let me mention just uh, one other uh, result, um, which is actually, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, which is that uh, actually any arbitrary stabilizer code uh, can be made single shot. Um, so so th this was via Earl. And um, th the idea here is that uh, you take some combinations, like instead of measuring the original stabilizer generators, uh, you take some combinations of these uh, stabilizers uh, that makes it more resilient to uh, measurement errors. Uh, but uh, one weakness here is that uh, if you start with an LDPC code, because you take so many combinations of the stabilizer generators, then it might not remain uh, low weight uh, for, for these uh, checks that you actually have to perform. Okay, so now I kind of talked about single shot a lot, but like, let me give the actual definition that we use. Um, so for CSS codes, uh, as we're gonna, uh, yeah, so, so, we, so we're talking about CSS codes where it suffices to decode uh, X and Z error separately, and furthermore, these quantum tanner codes are symmetric between X and Z, so we just uh, consider one type of error. So what happens is that uh, we have some X type error uh, E, then the syndrome is going to be HZ times E, and uh, furthermore, then uh, there's gonna be some syndrome error uh, D. So the actual input is going to be HZ E uh, plus D, which is this uh, sigma tilde, and we wanna output some candidate correction uh, F hat, which is the places where we would apply the X correction. Then we say that the decoder is alpha beta single shot if for sufficiently low weight errors, which is, is kind of vague here, but uh, for sufficiently low weight errors, the residual error um, E plus F hat uh, has weight bounded by alpha times E plus uh, beta times D. And the subscript R just means that it's the uh, stabilizer reduced weight uh, where we add arbitrary stabilizers to uh, decrease the, the Hamming weight because uh, the stabilizers don't have any uh, logical effect on the code state. Okay, so now let me start talking about the actual code that uh, we're doing. Um, so, like, we don't need a lot of details here, but uh, just like for these quantum Tanner codes, it's based on uh, the left-right Cayley complex, which is some two-dimensional geometric object with vertices, uh, edges, and faces, and the faces are squares. So we place the qubits on the squares of this complex, and we place uh, checks on the vertices. And the uh, vertices can be bipartitioned into the Vx and Vz, and on Vx we place the x-type checks, on Vz we place the z-type checks. Uh, and, and the checks on a given vertex are going to be affecting the uh, qubits uh, on the neighboring uh, faces. So that's kind of a rough picture for, for how these quantum Tanner codes works, and uh, they have uh, asymptotically good parameters uh, if you choose uh, everything correctly. So the uh, decoder um, that we're gonna prove a single shot is this mismatch decomposition decoder uh, by Leverrier and Zaymore. And uh, uh, let me give you a sketch of how it works. So we have some X-type error uh, affecting these qubits, and uh, in the first step, we determine some candidate corrections around every uh, vertex. So each uh, vertex is the Z-type checks, and um, we uh, figure out what is the lowest weight correction that we need on the neighboring uh, qubits in order to satisfy all the checks of that vertex. So that's epsilon v. Then 
uh, we compute this noisy, uh, or I guess mismatch vector that, that could be noisy. Um, and the idea here is that uh, for every single face, uh, it has two uh, uh, z-type checks that affect it. So uh, they might agree or disagree on this uh, 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 qubit on, on what to do. So, uh, right, so if they disagree, then there's going to be some uh, mismatch there. And we compute this mismatch for uh, every single uh, qubit. So that's a vector in F2 to the n. Then uh, at every step, we're going to be modifying uh, epsilon v in some local region in order to decrease the mismatch. And in the case that the uh, sorry, in the case that uh, there's no measurement noise, then we can always reach zero mismatch. Uh, in which case, we just apply the final correction because everything agrees. Uh, in the case that there is some syndrome noise, uh, then it's possible that we can't get to zero. But then we just do our best uh, that we can uh, to apply the final correction. So this algorithm can be run either sequentially uh, or in parallel. Uh, because in the uh, main step of the algorithm, like we just do all of these local uh, updates uh, in parallel. OK, so uh, then what was shown is that this decoder, in the case that there's no syndrome noise, uh, can correct all errors up to a constant fraction of the uh, code length. And furthermore, the time complexity is order n for the sequential decoder and order log n for the parallel decoder. OK, so uh, yeah, I guess let me uh, skip some of this part. Um, but uh, I guess, yeah, the idea is that like the expansion uh, of the complex will, will basically guarantee that uh, the, uh, this decoder is actually single shot. Because you can make uh, possible corrections in, in many different places. Uh, so, uh, which is also why the, uh, the parallel decoder works. Um, and if the syndrome noise affects like some of these possible corrections, uh, you can still uh, make uh, corrections in other parts. And uh, that's also why the, the final uh, residual error uh, is going to have weight bounded by the uh, syndrome uh, initial, like the syndrome error that occurred. Okay, so here, here's the result that we show, uh, which is that there's some uh, constants such that if the, uh, d uh, if the initial errors, like the data and the syndrome errors, are sufficiently small, then the sequential decoder is going to be zero beta single shot. And the parallel decoder uh, with k iterations is a 2 to the minus k beta single shot. So for the parallel decoder, like we don't have to run it until it gets stuck. Like we can just set some uh, fixed number of iterations and, and stop after you get to that many uh, iterations. So uh, if we run it for k iterations, then it's going to be 2 to the minus k beta single shot. So we can ask like, uh, what happens when there's multiple rounds of errors, and, and we do this uh, single shot quantum error correction procedure. And uh, what happens is that if the errors are uh, all, like if the errors are sufficiently small uh, at every single round, then we show that the residual errors uh, is, uh, is always going to remain bounded. OK, so it's going to be uh, some less than some constant fraction of the uh, block length at every single step. So we keep it under control. Uh, but using this, um, using this theorem, we can kind of analyze the stochastic setting as well. So let's assume that there's some randomly distributed uh, uh, data and syndrome errors. And it, this can be quite general. Like there can be correlations in space or even in time. Uh, but we just require that the marginal distributions uh, at every single round uh, has like a low probability of uh, being very large. Then uh, what we show is that the final uh, residual error is going to uh, be very likely uh, going to be suppressed. Uh, and in fact, you can take m, the number of rounds, to be an uh, exponentially large number. And, and the proof of this uh, it, it basically follows directly from the previous theorem, just using a union bound uh, for the probability of large uh, errors at every round. So, um, what we, uh, so remember, like the parallel decoder with k iterations is actually an alpha beta uh, single shot decoder. And so we could take uh, k to be a sufficiently large constant. And what that means is that we can actually achieve a constant time decoding for these uh, quantum Tanner codes. So during the computation, we would run this uh, constant time decoder to keep the residual errors uh, small, uh, although it is non-zero. Uh, and then at the last round, 
when we want to read off the logical information, we would want some information with uh, no error. So then what we do is we would measure all the qubits in the uh, Z basis, um, because let's, like, we just want to perform a logical uh, uh, Z uh, measurement. And what this allows us to do is to treat all the measurement errors as uh, an X qubit error right before the measurement. And so then we can run either the log n iteration parallel decoder or just use the sequential uh, decoder uh, in order to perfectly recover the information. So the, uh, these, the, uh, the sequential decoder uh, has alpha equal to zero, and, it, and because we treat all of the measurement errors uh, as uh, qubit errors, then um, like this d is also equal to zero, so there's no uh, residual error. Okay, so in, in summary, uh, we basically show that the uh, sequential and parallel uh, mismatch decomposition decoders uh, are single shot, and these are decoders for uh, quantum Tanner codes. And uh, additionally, we can actually uh, achieve uh, constant time decoding using the uh, parallel decoder. So there are some like open questions remaining. Like the uh, first, a uh, very natural one is: uh, Are all of these uh, decoders for a good quantum LDPC code single shot? And I suspect that like, it probably is because um, all of the constructions are you know very similar and they're based on expansion. And all of the decoders are this local greedy type decoder. So so I believe that it's probably a single shot as well. Um, and another one is how to decrease the constants uh, for the codes uh, because uh, you know we prove some. Uh, asymptotic uh, results, but in fact, like the constants involved are, are quite large. Uh, so for practical purposes, we would need to address this problem. And finally, uh, if you have a co good code and a decoder, then that allows you to have a good quantum uh, memory. But if we want to perform computation, then we need to figure out a good ways to have uh, logical gates. Okay, so that's, that's it, and uh, thanks for listening. Any questions? Right, one here. Then Ken next. Ken second. I think we only Thanks for the great talk. Uh, for the expander code, th th uh, for small small set flip decoder, the previous work has shown single shot decoder. Yes. And why does this proof don't straightforward? You're doing something different. It seems, uh, but why does this proof straightforward the generalize to good LDPC code? Uh, uh, so, so uh, we actually use many of the same ingredients uh, as the uh, um, like small steps. What's the difference between previous work and your technical contribution? Uh, so, so like I mean, the, the decoder is not exactly the same. I mean, it's using this um, uh, mismatch uh, function instead of the syndrome. So, there's some work that needs to be done to. Uh, you know, so to, to, to still use those kind of similar ingredients, but for this uh, mismatch function okay. uh, instead. Thank you very much. One more question from Ken. We've only got time for one, sorry. Yeah, um, I was just curious about your thoughts on like hook errors. So in these uh, quantum LDBC codes, how does the hook error actually corrupt data during like stabilizer readout? Uh, right, so yeah, I guess for there, like for, for that, uh, you need like some specific uh, scheme for actually measuring the errors. Like here, I guess it's maybe more of a phenomenological where, uh, a model where we assume that like there is some, let's say there's some rate of qubit errors and some rate of uh, measurement errors, right, then yeah, so let me, um, just as a follow-up, is there, what I, what I don't understand, is there something about the expander graph that tells me that the hooks can't expand too much, or is it the other way? Uh, if the expansion of the complex. So I thought there was some work that was being done saying that certain of these like LDPC codes, like you do not have uh, uh, hook errors, uh, but yeah, we, did, we didn't, didn't look at that like, question for circuit-based model like, in, in detail because, uh, I, I mean, I'm sure like, the results will still uh, pr uh, hold because you can probably map one noise model into another uh, noise model, like with the, even with the hook errors, like if you just you know, assume a lower rate of errors. Uh, but yeah, I mean, for the details. Yeah. Let's thank Bailey again.